Who came up with High Delft? That's great. I love that. <laughs> I think that that's amazing. So uh, the idea for making the movie, if you could just, uh, you brought it up, Pen, when you introduced the film. But Tim, I'm wondering if you could revisit it from your perspective. Um, well, I'd been uh, thinking about Vermeer for quite a while because it, you know, the pictures just looked photo real. You know, you can tell sometimes when you're looking at art that the artist started with a photograph. Yeah. There's something about it that subconsciously we know there's, there's something just a little too real about it. Um, and I got that, pic that feeling looking at, at Vermeer's. And, um, it, and uh, it was just kind of, a, yeah, that's kind of weird. Until uh, one day um, it occurred to me in the bathtub that he may have been able to copy the colors exactly. And if you could do that, you could make a handmade photograph. Mm -hmm. And, and it, uh, I wrote down the idea so I wouldn't forget. And, and uh, not too long after that, I did a, a simple experiment uh, that we show in the film on, on my kitchen table mm -hmm. where I painted, essentially painted a photograph. And it was the first time I'd ever used oil paint in my life. Yeah. And, um, Literally, I did have to learn how to operate a paintbrush. You know, it's, it's not obvious what you're supposed to do with it. Um, and that is the point that I got to uh, where I, it took me about five hours to paint that thing. That's the point where I got a weird email from my friend Penn, who I've known for 25 or 30 years, uh, 25 years probably. And uh, just coincidentally, he, he said, um, I. Uh, I need to have an adult conversation. Can you please come here and talk to me? And it was, and I thought, oh my God, what's wrong with Penn? He's, <laughs> that he's, uh, he's gone off the deep end, because I've never heard him say anything like that. So I said, of course, I'll be right out. And um, I don't know, did you tell him the story already? I told a little bit before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, from my point of view, um, uh, Penn said, I don't want to talk about show business or politics or work. Uh, you know, let's just have a conversation. And I said, uh, uh, well, what do you know about Vermeer? And, he's, and he's, he said, uh, the artist. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I, uh, I, I think I went to a, the, the show um, that he did. There's there a big show in New York. And he's like this photo real painter. I said, yeah. And I said, I think I figured out how he did it. And he said, what? <laughs> and, and so I showed him this video that I had and, um, you know, he immediately got it. And uh, Penn and Teller being magicians, uh, I hope I'm not giving anything away here, they use mirrors sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and, um, it stays in this room. Ixnay on the ear of me. Ixnay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, he said this is something very much like what we call mirror masking, where the mirror has to be in an exact position such that two images will appear to be the sa in the same place. And uh, he understood it immediately, and he said, what are you gonna do with this? And I said, I'm gonna try to make kind of a, repaint something that looks kind of like a Vermeer. I'm gonna you know, buy an old chair and a chandelier and, and, uh, and make an experiment. And he said, and, and I told him I'd probably you know, like write a paper about it and maybe make a YouTube video. And he said, that is a really stupid idea. Um, <laughs> Let's go to Los Angeles tomorrow and try to pitch this and see if we can get somebody to make a real movie out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started to snowball. And that was, uh, that was in 2009, in February. And we thought it would take a few months, a year to do something like that. But we just finished the film like a month ago. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then somebody told us, uh, I think it was Larry Blake, the sound guy, he says, yeah, documentaries always seem to take about four years. Uh, it's also important to say that we failed. I mean, when we went to L.A. to, to tell people we wanted to make this uh, movie, um, nobody would. And I think part of the problem was, uh, or maybe all the problem was me, because we would go in to uh, different studios and say, uh, my friend Tim uh, is going to paint a Vermeer in his warehouse in uh, San Antonio, and they thought I was doing some sort of, you know, Borat gag on them, you know? They thought, well, here's Penn and Teller, and they do the bullshit thing, and he, they're doing, running some sort of scam on us. So he would set up the whole device and paint 
right in people's offices. And they would look around for like where we had the hidden camera and how we were monkeying with them. So I think I actually, by coming on board with Tim, I actually slowed him down. So finally we said, you know, well, let's let's have Teller direct it and let's just do it ourselves, which we did. And uh, But I, I think it's important to say that once I got on board, the whole project ground to a halt. <laughs> Well, Penn did say, stop doing what you're doing. Do not paint anything. Do not do anything more until we get this in place and get some cameras going. And, and that gives this film, I think, a kind of an unusual character because um, it was uh, from that point, which was you know, the very first concept, it was covered from uh, you know, like up to nine angles uh, with mm -hmm. live cameras. Uh, Teller insisted that I, I set up as many cameras as possible. We couldn't, uh, you know, we really couldn't afford to have a full-time uh, film crew working 24-7. Um, so we just, he, uh, Teller decided to overcover it and yeah. turn, just, we just flipped on the cameras in the morning, just let them run and then, you know, put everything on hard disk. And by the way, when Tim says we flipped on the switch, that was Tim flipping on the switch. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I would uh -huh. flip he it on. He was a man alone and in a was, room um, with nine cameras, so. <laughs> Some, yeah. Uh, it was something like 2,400 hours, I believe, of raw material. And that's quite a ratio for any film. Um, so. <laughs> when you consider that porno was like 1.2 to 1, <laughs> yeah. that's a real ratio. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what was the editing process like? I mean... That's a lot of footage to watch, right? It was it was <laughs> long. It was a year. Uh -huh. It was about a year, right? Probably about about a year. Yeah. And we, we had, I mean, we have a great editor on this film who deserves his own round of applause. His name is Patrick Sheffield. And Let's give it to him. <laughs> and Patrick Patrick was the the uh, the archaeologist who went went through and excavated this this twenty four hundred hours to pick out this. You know, the first the first step was just picking out the stuff that jumps out at you. You know, as Stanislavski says about uh, about working on a role in a play, he says, don't try to work on it all at once. Find the places in the play that jump out at you first, and then uh, widen those, and you'll find they widen, and eventually you'll understand the whole thing. And that's what Patrick went in and found those those gems that sort of began to tell us where the thrust of the story was. And you know, we we had all sorts of crazy conceptual ideas that we went into this with. We thought, uh, first thing we thought was that this was basically Penn's story because I had initially heard it from Penn. We had Penn tell us the whole story. We looked at that and compared it to the footage and said, nope, that's not the story. And then we thought, well, oh, this is like a Penn and Teller bullshit episode, and we'll, we'll do all these little wraparounds, and then we'll periodically throw to Tim. And that was stupid, because what kept coming out over and over again was that this is a story in which Tim and his obsession and his drive and his love were the, were the focus of it. And we even had this crazy idea at one point that we were going to have that, that, that it was going to be covered like a video game, so there'd be a column at one side indicating how Tim's life force was diminishing <laughs> as he was as he was working on it. But uh, I think that the the breakthrough for us was just at the at one point we decided to try that the very opening thing where Tim states his purpose, and that guided us for the rest of the rest of the film. So it ends up looking looking and feeling to me simple. But you know, if, if you think about how much you have to know to understand each phase of this story, it wasn't simple at all. There's a lot of you know a lot of really complicated things that you learned without really having much pain over it, which are imparted um, with great oh, lucidity. Oh, I was just going to say, so, um, for me, something that's quite um, wonderful that happened is from the moment that uh, Penn said to Tim, "Stop what you're doing. This has to be a, f a movie." Uh, then Tim needed to reconsider uh, the parameters of his experiment and that it was really going to be a real experiment and that he had to conduct it impeccably and have every brush stroke uh, recorded. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, um, in terms of how the, just the adventure of the story, there really wasn't, I mean, Penn was an old dear friend of Martin Mull's and knows Martin as a painter. And so that part of what was going to happen that uh, that we wanted to meet with Martin and have Tim be the you know show M Martin his uh, painting and all of that but everything in terms of what happened with David Hockney and what mm -hmm. happened with Tim seeing the Queen's painting 
all of that unfolded as the, you know, in real time as the story, uh, as Tim was doing his thing. And so um, I really want to say, like, nothing was foreseen. <laughs> It's rare to have a documentary that uh, you actually uh, cover a real event as opposed to looking back on an event or as opposed to manufacturing an event. We really, uh, and because of technology, I mean, I, the, the movie is kind of about technology and technology makes this movie possible. This movie could not be done 10 years ago. You, you would not have the storage, you would not have the money to be able to cover nine cameras of every brushstroke of someone painting. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to me that the technology allows the movie to be made about the technology of the 17th century that allowed those paintings to be made. And, and you also wouldn't have had this movie without Skype, because every time Tim is talking to you, he's really talking to Farley, uh, who, who was in Los Angeles <laughs> at the time. So it, she was able to check in on him daily electronically. There was a seminal moment for me uh, when Teller was out for one of his visits in San Antonio, uh, where uh, uh, we're on camera, and, and Teller said, you know, Tim, uh, this movie is gonna be very different if you fail. <laughs> and, and I said, ain't gonna be no movie if, if I fail. And he says, oh yes, there will. <laughs> That's when I realized I had to solve these problems. We can do a couple questions from the audience. Yes. Given how long it took to do this change, um, the elements that you were painting were changed, like the light, lighting or the how, how did you deal with that same step again? And second question um, is Two interesting questions. Uh, the first question is how did, um, as Tim was painting over the long duration of the project, um, deal with changing factors of change uh, that were built into the process? And then the second question is as he was um, going into uh, the research and then doing the work, did it tell him anything about the forgeries of Vermeer over the years? Yeah, well the, the process is kind of like photography but not kind of like photography. Um, it's not like you're taking a snapshot. You know, when you look at a cam camera obscura image, um, everything's changing. I mean, if you're standing there and I'm looking at your, your image on the wall, well, if you wave, it'll wave. You know, everything changes. It's not, there is no snapping. That happened in, 19, in 1839 when they figured out how to fix that image and hold it stationary. So things are always changing. And as a practical matter, um, when I started, the room was empty, and I just painted the back wall, the windows, uh, the painting on the the painting on the wall was there. The mirror was there on the wall. Uh, otherwise, there was nothing else in there. The tiles were on the floor. I painted those things. Then, one at a time, I bring in each object, and each object is really a separate painting. And if the light is a little different when I paint the rug versus the harpsichord, well. Uh, as long as it's within reason, you'll never know. But there's a very interesting thing that happens, and you would think that there would just be a killer objection that the light will change when clouds go over the sun, and the whole outdoors that's coming in through those windows will get darker or lighter. And it turns out it matters not one bit, because the same light that is illuminating the room is illuminating the canvas. So when you're sitting there looking at that mirror and comparing those two things, they will both brighten and darken at exactly the same rate. The color will change. I have this one time-lapse camera above the painting that fires every 10 seconds. And you'll see that image get brighter and darker and bluer and redder. I was totally unaware of that as I was painting. It doesn't matter. It's like automatic gain control is built into this machine. Uh, now your second question, about uh, forgers, uh, and, and there's a whole question about uh, can't, uh, can't beginning painting students just walk up 
in a museum and set up their uh, uh, easel and paint, you know, a Rembrandt or whatever? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, sorta. But uh, you know, I won't fool anybody for a minute. Um, so, what about uh, you know? Couldn't I just copy the Vermeer? Well, that that would be a different experiment. Um, but there was this forger named um, uh, Han, Han von Megeren, uh, who just before World War II, uh, in the 30s, became one of the richest men in Holland because he kept discovering new Vermeers. <laughs> and, you know, they'd come from a dusty old castle someplace, and there'd be a backstory, you know, well, I had to sell it because my family's going broke. And uh, he sold these Vermeers for princely sums, and that's why he's one of the rich, richest men in Holland. And um, after uh, World War II, they uh, threw him in prison because they discovered that Hermann Goering, the Nazi, had a Vermeer in his possession, and, and there was a, a, a uh, invoice that it was sold by Han von Megeren mm. to Hermann Goering. So they, they threw him in jail, and, and we're going to kill him for, for treason because he'd sold uh, this Dutch treasure to the Nazis. And um, he said, well, I, I'm actually a hero <laughs> because I painted that picture. And they go, right. And he said, bring me some brushes and bring me uh, a canvas and I'll, I'll paint you another one. And off he goes, and sure enough, he paints another Vermeer. Now, the Vermeers that M von Megeren painted are look nothing like the Vermeers we know. There, if you look at a book on Vermeer, there are two paintings at the very beginning of the book. One is called uh, uh, Christ in the House of Mary and Martha, and the other one is called Diana and Her Companions, and they look nothing like the rest of the Vermeers. They look like Italian paintings. And von Megeren was emulating that style, not the later photographic style of Vermeer. And um, that's, uh, that's my explanation. I don't think those first two pictures in every Vermeer book are actually Vermeers. Uh, they, uh, they have no, you, know, you, you try to do the provenance to trace them back to when they were last owned, you know, down through the ages. They only go back to the 1800s. And uh, we're really getting off on a tangent here. But they were, um, they were authenticated by a man named uh, Abraham Bradius. Um, uh, who was the same man who authenticated the phony von Megerens as Vermeers, the same man, uh, authentic authenticated all those forgeries. So um, what I learned was uh, that von Megeren uh, attempted, uh, made a few attempts to paint the later Vermeer style and failed. Couldn't sell them. They, they, they were a joke. Um, he couldn't do it. He couldn't. I don't think you can do it without either modern photography to help you, you know, like Chuck Close starts with a, a slide and then he dissects it and then he matches the colors and, you know, all hyper-realist work in some similar way. But I don't think you, without photography, I don't think it's possible for a human to paint a Vermeer uh, that looks like that. Um, there's so much more to talk about, but we have the high sign. We have to get out of here, but thank you all for coming, and thank was you. Was that one question? Me. What? No, there was, no, there were really three? <laughs> Something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.